So Cortland County has decided for at least a, a decade to invest in a new jail. And uh, for the last decade or, decade or so, uh, there, there have been increasing pressures, um, both in terms of its own population, daily population of prisoners, um, and also the State Commission on Corrections uh, to invest in a new jail uh, to house uh, a population um, that is more than uh, 60 uh, people per day. Um, I'm, I'm not sure right now about the, the percentages, um, the rate of incarceration, uh, but so uh, for in order to get a variance they um, proposed and got from uh, the OK, the green light from the state, from Albany, to convert the gym into a 30 bed additional uh, um, lockup and possibilities for um, even including uh, people from uh, from other state uh, from other counties or uh, now federal prisoners. Um, so that's the current state, and what has happened in recent months is that the legislature passed a $150,000 study uh, to cite, give us six site, possible sites uh, for a new prison construction, um, and if that would get okayed in the next two years, then uh, they will, the state will uh, approve one of the six sites, and uh, the county then would uh, have to look at bonding for this new jail. And right now they're looking at $40 million for the construction. And uh, with the bonds and additional monies to be raised, uh, it easily could double, uh, as we have seen with pr uh, jail and prison constructions around the country. So it's a huge investment. And right now for Cortland uh, residents and concerned uh, Folks in the community, it gives us pause and uh, an opportunity to think about alternatives uh, to such a uh, big project. How could we invest actually $40 million and still uh, get to the point of um, in increasing justice, increasing harm reduction, and public health and safety for our community? So, uh, we, of course, have a number of ideas that have been shared uh, nationally and internationally uh, what could be done instead of uh, constructing a new jail. For um, a little history is perhaps in order now uh, in terms of thinking in, uh, about reforms and jails um, coming to any town. And even the undersheriff um, Barnhart said, uh, you build it and they will come. And so that has been panning out for the over the last 200 years of the modern jail and prison project in the United States that has uh, quickly uh, garnered support around the world. But we have to think about it was really in Philadelphia where the first jail for the Young Republic was established in the hopes that people who go in for a set uh, period of time come out uh, really wholesome and new people ready to be reintegrated in the community. So it was a wonderful reform idea that went completely sour in practice because what they found instead is uh, that the jail became a re revolving door for uh, the m uh, majority of the prisoners sent in, into the dungeon. And so no matter what reform strategies were pursued, uh, the recidivism rate, the revolving door, never uh, really abated. Um, so when in recent decades the drug war started, um, and so we, we really saw how the jail population uh, six-tupled, um, in, in that now um, people who had mental health issues and uh, drug addictions were wandering into the jail cells at uh, alarming rates. And that happened at the same time that the asylums, the mental health hospitals, were closed in the state. So we saw really a transfer from the asylum to the uh, big prison. And now uh, we actually have, we are in a bit uh, ironic space here, namely that uh, the state is closing, has closed uh, over a dozen 
prisons, uh, penitentiaries, if you will. And at the same time, we see that jails are enlarged or newly constructed at the county level. And so what makes for this uh, discrepancy? What we've seen is that uh, the, basically the drug convictions have been scaled back. Instead of uh, 15 to life, uh, people are getting a sentence of maybe a year or several years, which then impacts, of course, uh, the jails. And so, you know, one of the obvious uh, wishes then of our community uh, is to invest in more uh, drug rehabilitation centers uh, that are well run and where agencies have a good track record. And in terms of the existing ones where we see uh, people having mandated to maybe 20, 28 days, uh, that may not be sufficient. Um, of a stay in order to deal with one's uh, addictions uh, and multiple addictions effectively. And so it is really uh, puzzling that we have, um, there's no end in sight of locking somebody up um, for $80 or $100 a day um, in, in a jail cell with no support or very little programming, but we uh, can't find enough housing on the outside or enough rehab spaces, uh, which would be um, actually um, much less expensive, uh, at least in the long run, as we, um, uh, as many studies have shown. And so there's really a fiscal responsibility here to uh, rethink the jailing of America, the jailing in Cortland. Um, and to invest in programs that have high success rates and um, provide really m meaningful alternatives to incarceration. One of the wonderful programs that we have in town um, is the Wishing Wellness Center. It's a recovery center staffed by uh, caring folks who have themselves been through the recovery process and therefore they have a compassionate understanding what it takes um, to uh, take this thorny road towards recovery. Uh, for acknowledging that one has a problem and then moving um, through with um, good therapies uh, to the goal um, of uh, leaving that addiction and finding gainful employment, uh, getting custody of the children. And one of the programs that we have uh, in the central New York is uh, the CCA program of uh, Syracuse, and they're also in New York City and Rochester. It is the Center for Community Alternatives, and they have a number of wonderful uh, uh, programs that help with, you know, they say positive thinking, parent success initiatives, gainful employment, housing, dealing with HIV awareness, um, and uh, so with their holistic uh, approach, they have a much greater success rate in getting people uh, on the right track and a much higher percentage um, than, uh, for instance, the dr drug courts have panned out to be. Yeah? One thing I want to stress about the Cortland, the 2015 Cortland Jail Expansion Report is that they quote an earlier study uh, that was done for the county by the federal government which notes that the citizens of the county are ultimately responsible for the punishment they want to see in their community. And so the punishment I want to see in this community, and many uh, residents share this concern uh, because they don't want to invest, for instance, in $40 million in a jail uh, that may not work and may not increase one's, uh, one's uh, safety and security, is um, uh, really uh, to bring our community together as we have never done before, you know, through community mentoring, to, through a community justice program, um, and to really understand here why jails um, should be considered uh, toxic assets rather than creating more wealth and stability and security and harm reduction for our community. So Angela Davis um, has written that the penal system as a whole does not produce wealth. It devours the social wealth that could be used to subsidize housing for the homeless, to ameliorate public education for poor and racially marginalized communities, to open free drug rehabilitation programs for people who wish to kick their habits, 
to create a national healthcare system, to expand programs to combat HIV, to eradicate domestic abuse, and in the process to recreate, to create well-paying paying jobs for the unemployed. And I misread, I said recreate jobs. We actually, Cortland community uh, was a hub of uh, wonderful employment opportunities um, up maybe until the 1980s. Now it's of course the college uh, that is the largest empo employer in the region. And so we have to think creatively um, in terms of uh, imp uh, entrepreneurship, in terms of the uh, working with the new BOCES for uh, technical skills uh, for uh, high school students that are on the verge of dropping out, not getting a high school degree, um, and to in engage in a technical or vocational path um, that would be the road towards success. For instance, we all need plumbers and electricians. And uh, that's a job that uh, has um, uh, a really good track record, and it is also something that is taught, um, has been taught in some of the prison um, correctional educational programs, and those folks all have gotten employment. Um, so it is really, again, as, um, an investment in uh, housing, uh, it's a critical need. Uh, we have an um, aging housing stock in Cortland. Of getting new housing with private public venture uh, joint venture programs um, to invest in employment to keep people here and uh, really the have graduates we have uh, we draw on a pool of over thirty thousand uh, students um, college students in central New York um, from Binghamton to Syracuse you know and many of the students leave the area for lack of jobs so uh, that also needs to be changed. What we can say in terms of people who go to prisons um, and, and the lo local jail uh, are those um, who have dropped uh, out of education. We see a lot of um, people who are basically functionally illiterate in jails and prisons uh, around the country and in many countries in the world. So it is people who don't have literacy skills, who can't navigate the complex and technological world of today, um, who are left out and left behind. And um, so if we identify those folks at risk um, of losing out of the educational system, uh, with, for instance, um, a peer mentoring and an adult to children a mentoring program, much could be saved. And I also want to remind uh, our audience that New York State penal law was amended in June 2006 to add a new goal to the four traditional sentencing goals. Uh, the sentencing goals that f philosophers established of uh, deterrence, rehabilitation, retribution, and incapacitation. The new law now requires that sentencing decisions take into account the promotion of the con convicted person's successful and productive re-entry and reintegration into society. So I am really in good stead here. I am not pro proposing anything outlandish. It is actually New York State penal law, and I have educated um, uh, area district attorneys on these, this penal law who did not know about it, that it, since 2006, almost a decade ago, uh, added uh, re-entry and re reintegration as a sentencing goal. So the old adage of um, um, dessert-based punishment, you know, they have it coming, right, uh, is tail them, nail them, and jail them. We have to reverse this image. It is not about tailing them. It is about mentoring people, educating them, uh, raising awareness, also raising the age of criminal responsibility. That uh, what is it about uh, 16 and 17 year olds that make them culpable of a crime and then treat them as adults filling our local jail with uh, um, folks that otherwise are considered minors. Um, in terms of policies regarding licit um, uh, alcohol, um, uh, drug consumption, or tobacco consumption, right? And uh, so, you know, raising the age is would help a lot um, in terms of reducing the jail population, because we know criminologists have told us that 
the largest group of people going into the prison system are those between the ages of 16 and 25. And something magical happens at 25 years of age, um, and that is where the frontal lobe of your brain actually develops its full capacity. So the brain actually grows till at least the age of 25 in most people. And what the frontal lobe does, psychologists tell us, is um, monitoring the executive functions. How well are we thinking about the consequences of our actions? A certain male population, youthful male population, is really high risk in the decisions they make and perhaps forgetful of the consequences of their actions. And they can be lovingly told and mentored um, to not do certain things or hear the you know things uh, the uh, the fallout of your actions um, and they will harm you and certainly lots of other people around you. Uh, and you know one of the prototype cases, of course, is driving without a seat, a seat belt and thinking about the large ramifications to society uh, uh, in terms of that um, irresponsible action, right? And so, if we divert youthful offenders into the youth um, division uh, of the criminal justice system, um, we have already emptied out the local jail dramatically. Um, so that is one take. And um, with the youth specifically, and through education and training, we can then really focus on the reentry and reintegration as part of a wonderful harm reduction and public health and safety strategy. Um, furthermore, um, we have seen in a statistic that the Cortland Jail um, had a population of about 30% of um, black uh, people uh, incarcerated. Uh, that seems rather unacceptable given that the uh, black, the census shows the black population of Cortland is about 3%, maybe 4% in 2015. Um, so there's really an uh, over-reliance on the jail system um, uh, in, to punish um, residents who are black um, prior to even to their sentences that they're given. And national data um, uh, also um, pen, you know, basically just show that kind of uh, racial discriminatory justification that black and also Latino um, defendants get a routinely higher bail set, um, their pre-trial sentence may be longer, and then certainly their punishment may be disproportionately harsher than those given to white defendants. Um, so what we, what we really need to get at, one of the huge issues is that a local jail has turned um, into a bail jail. And this is also the analysis that our Chief Justice Lippmann has come to and repeatedly in his uh, state of the union or the state of the justice system in the New York state, um, he has uh, told the legislature to reform the broken system. And what it means is we basically need to get rid of commercial bail. Um, we need to um, look at the risk assessment. The public defender's office uh, does complain that there, uh, the defendants they work with, um, the risk assessment is set too high and uh, therefore the bail tends to be set uh, as well too high and uh, two-thirds uh, of the local jail population uh, is basically people awaiting trial. So one should really ask, uh, we should ask ourselves, what is, um, does it have to do with the nature of the crime? Um, does it have to do with the uh, character of the person? Why is it that we condemn certain people um, to sit out um, in uh, jail awaiting their sentence in the plea bargain, as it often happens. And what the Attorney General Robert Kennedy has said, it's all about money. If the defendant has money, uh, the nature of the crime is not an issue, the character of the person is not, not an issue. It all amounts to, I can I uh, raise enough funds to get myself out of here? And what we also know, the people who get out um, on bail, um, you know, say at arraignment, uh, with their privately uh, hired attorney, they also get lower uh, sentences. 
so our local um, jail captain has admitted that many of uh, the defendants sitting uh, awaiting judgment um, at judgment day are often released um, um, on that very day they are to time served so time served is ultimately in his words yeah as a law enforcement uh, professional um, a failure of the system of not granting people bail and so that they can continue their jobs um, take care of their families and children and uh, be re reintegrated um, at the same time um, studies have shown that um, the minute you enter jail, something changes in you psychically. Uh, within three days, you are normalized to the prison system. You have made prison your home. Uh, the shock value is no longer there. And then the thorny road uh, 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 towards leaving jail begins, and for most, it ends up in accumulating technical violation and going straight back to jail. There are a few people in the local jail who may have had 40 arrests. Um, and, uh, so it is for them, um, jail certainly has become home. And for us, as civil society, that should be unacceptable. We also hear of people who go to jail because they're homeless. And uh, the winter in Cortland are quite harsh. And so they may break a window um, of a private home and turn themselves in, yeah, I've judge, I've done it, and then they have secured a card in the jail. Um, we don't have a, a, a shelter locally, and for various reasons they may not uh, be able to get DSS support um, in order to be housed in, in a motel or other facility. Um, and so this is really the ultimate failure if um, the jail becomes a boarding house yeah? uh, for people who are not willing to commit crimes um, uh, if they have other opportunities to have safe um, and warm housing and rather than freezing to death under a bridge. So uh, those are you know, some of the diagnostic things that I could um, want to share with the audience. And what we need to do first of all is um, basically declare a moratorium on the new jail plan and um, then we need to ref uh, review the finances of the jail um, and re review the repair plan of the current jail um, the jail studies they have shared also said in a footnote yes a jail uh, building usually uh, lasts about 30 years you know, if we now invest in a, a golden jail of $40 million plus, um, probably will not have paid back the bonds on that in 30 years. So the next generations are asked to you know, be taxed on this burden of um, more empty, decrepit structures um, uh, down the road. And so is this really the way we want to uh, go forward? And especially in a state that has, in New York City, basically decarcerated, has uh, relied less on uh, jailing people, um, especially those um, who Gottschalk has called, you know, being part of the three nons, the non-violence, the non-serious, um, the non-sex offenders. Um, and uh, we have had a spike in our, in our local jail population of mis misdemeanors. And when we actually parcel out to check which misdemeanor charges, um, people being in jail um, uh, because they can't make bail on misdemeanor charges, many of them are drug related. So the drug busts around uh, methamphetamines have uh, very much uh, proved that point. Um, a new local law was passed really with the mandate to uh, um, uh, route out the, the meth problem. and. So Cortland decided to declare its own war on this particular drug. And needless to say, the local uh, jail population has spiked in this particular regard. In New York City, those folks would not never enter the, the jail cell yeah, if they're there on misdemeanor charges. Yeah? So in one swoop, we would have basically um, eliminated 50% to two-thirds of the jail uh, population on any given day. And 
uh, in terms of folks on any given day actually um, condemned, you know, with a sentence of one year, say, or less, um, half a year, uh, we're looking at about 15 people. Imagine if the Cortland jail actually was primarily for those uh, people who are serving their convicted uh, for a particular charge, for doing harm in a particular way. 15 people. Would we then really talk about investing a new jail with 150 beds in the first phase and possibly 200 beds in the second phase? Uh, I remind you that we have a population of about 20,000 in the city, maybe 40,000 uh, or close to 50,000 in the entire county. Do we really need to have that kind of mass incarceration? And of course, uh, the judges uh, work such that if there's a jail bed that's free, they're more likely to lock somebody up um, with high bail um, than re releasing on recognizance. And what we uh, really need to do um, is to uh, ask uh, that the police um, issues tickets and summons instead of um, issuing arrests and uh, book people overnight um, or book them to jail, uh, the county jail rather than city jail. Um, and you know, so you know, uh, with advanced technologies, it should be possible to um, ascertain the flight risk. You know, when you fingerprint a person, where are they going, going to go? You know, skipping state line no longer is an option uh, in terms of not being found. Um, and uh, so it is. We are working really in in the sense, at least in our thinking, with 19th century technology in the way we are. Uh, thoughtlessly throwing people in jail who could very well um, be um, living in the community at a fraction of the cost um, of what it takes to jail somebody. Um, so we need to review uh, in specifically who actually is in jail, so we really need to invest in an assessment of our needs and uh, whether you know alternatives to incarceration um, could that, that are focused on justice reinvestment strategies um, could be beneficial. So I'm not uh, specifically talking about um, probation here or parole, um, but really in terms of reintegration as penal, the penal law from 2006, um, amended as it was, uh, suggests to us. So we need to invest in judges, really have a communication and dialogue with them to, to share with them the problem of the jail bail. Um, and I don't think they are really educated in the sense that I, for instance, had the luxury of educating a, a justice ministry, um, or the person who ran the Ministry of Justice for the entire country of Mali in West Africa. He told me, yes, um, uh, Dr. Nagel, I was very much into harsh justice. I locked up uh, people for a long time and then I had a change of mind and it was when my children came crying to me in the uh, at home and saying, Daddy, uh, people, the kid, the other kids, neighborhood kids don't want to play with us. And he said, why? Why, why is that? Well, they're telling us that you are kidnapping people. So he had all of a sudden a change of heart. Um, to say, you know, maybe I need to invest in something else than throwing mindlessly people into jail. When we know fully well, they tend not to come out as whole persons. Um, as I said, it takes only three days to acclimate yourself to the prison culture. Um, and uh, the uh, jail captain has shared with me that, yes, he's seen a change in demeanor with people who are locked up for more than five days. Yeah. So maybe in Cortland it's five days, um, but in, nationwide the studies share with us um, anything over two days has really uh, quite terrible effects on uh, rehabilitation and, um, and then reintegration. Um, we need to um, abolish uh, commercial bail, as I said. We need to train all officers regarding um, mental, uh, mentally disturbed persons. Um, that there's already uh, efforts in doing that so that the tasering has gone, uh, rate has gone down in Cortland. 
uh, that is uh, really good news and more uh, I think needs to be done to train all officers in um, the various uh, departments, the sheriff, um, city, um, police to begin with. And uh, really important is also to co consider training officers on implicit bias and unintended racism. Uh, it is uh, to me unacceptable that we have a, a very different racial um, uh, 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 rate of incarceration that affects the African American population much more so than the white population. Um, and so as uh, the Justice Department has uh, has asked various uh, large de police departments to do um, perhaps a racial impact study could show you know where we are lacking what the patterns are and um, you know how to help individual officers um, to change their policies um, we need to invest in mental health why is it uh, the case that our local mental health uh, department gives people an appointment um, two weeks or three weeks down the road when they have now a, a, a immediate need, if not a crisis. If it's a full-fledged crisis, there may still be an, an opening in the uh, psych unit in the hospital, but that will be very expensive. And so, uh, again, uh, we always seem to have uh, jail beds open, um, and if we don't, we uh, carry a, a transport. Um, remand prisoners elsewhere and to other counties at great expense to our taxpayers uh, but we seem to not manage to get a uh, um, larger mental health um, unit um, to to work effectively at a need at need basis um, and uh, you know help people uh, all of um, the people who need it not just those who have uh, great health insurance um, so we need to invest in safe rehab centers and work with regional facilities for extended stay. We need to invest in good housing. Uh, we also need to ensure that the people coming out of jail with a sentence, with a felony charge, uh, that uh, they are not banned for a lifetime um, to um, in, get gainful employment um, in, in a legal way as opposed to illegally. Um, so there are efforts around the country, uh, Syracuse has uh, joined, signed up Ithaca uh, as well to ban the box in employment practices, namely that one should not be, uh, one should not have to check a box um, to declare whether one has a felony conviction at the point of application. So many uh, formerly incarcerated people report that that basically uh, never gives them a chance to find um, employment. And uh, the same is true for education. Um, you know, a GED uh, does not help one to get uh, really great employment f for the most part. And so um, I would, of course, encourage that SUNY and the private colleges all open up their doors um, to formerly incarcerated who have a much uh, lower um, risk of reoffending than uh, the 18 year old coming out of high school. So, um, again, one should not have a felony st st um, status written on one's face and one's identity for the rest of one's life when one has already done the penalty um, of doing serious time in, in, uh, incarcerated. Right?